In May 1997, we did a series of four programs which we titled Intimacy with God. In it, we studied the human need to live near to God. It was one of the best received series we've ever done, and we've exhausted two printings of those programs and continue to have more requests for it. So we're doing them again. They really and truly are encore presentations. We begin today, right now. In all the hurry and hustle and confusion of modern living, the Lord has a way. We believe the Bible is a revelation of His way. We invite you to join us for In Search of the Lord's Way with Mac Lyon. My friend, it's a real joy to welcome you to our Bible study program, In Search of the Lord's Way. Today is the first of four encore presentations we'll be doing this month titled Intimacy with God. As before, they'll be available at the end of the month, in the, f in, uh, the four of them, in this little book, free to all who would like a copy. As always, they'll be available on audio cassette tape, too, and, and they'll be free. In the event you may want one of the free books or tapes, you might want to jot down our address now. It's In Search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma, 73083. Or by email at searchtv at aol.com. Or you may order by telephone. And we have an 800 number that you may use, and we'll even pay for the call. That number is 1-800-321-8633. Just ask for the book about God and we'll know what you're talking about. Although they won't be ready until the end of the month, if after the program uh, you think you'll want uh, one of the copies, it'd, it'd be a good idea to make your request now. To the development and growth of science and technology, the industri industrialized world enjoying living conditions far, far above anything that our foreparents could ever have dreamed about. In fact, probably more of them we, than we'll ever know were like my father, who hearing his first radio and seeing his first television said of each of them, they'll never perfect it, it'll never work. But with a hundred years of extraordinary human achievement has come also the devaluation of God. Being so totally surrounded with all this stuff that we've made for ourselves, God has become rather irrelevant, hasn't he? With the recent cloning of an animal and now so much talk about cloning humans, God seems to be even less important. All this materialism has made a closer walk with God difficult, to say the least, and even the church has found minimizing God. The series is not intended to be a rebuke to anybody, but an effort to restore our respect and reverence for God and to exalt Him and strengthen Him in our spiritual family and our national lives. Join the Edmund Church of Christ now as we sing together, will you? Then the program. In the 14th, 15th, and 16th chapters of the Gospel of John, we have the longest recorded speech that Jesus made, and it was to His disciples just prior to the time of His crucifixion. 
The 17th chapter then in, is his prayer the night before he died. And in it, beginning at verse 1, we have these words. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Now, with that bit of his prayer in mind, let's go to God in prayer ourselves. Our Father who art in heaven, we are so grateful to you and so thankful that you have made yourself available to us through the avenue of prayer. And we are trying our very best to live lives transformed, to present our bodies living sacrifices by which we may live in sacred nearness to you and enjoy a close walk with you. And we pray your, your blessings upon our lives to this intent. As we study this subject of coming close to you, we pray that you'll open our hearts, help us to understand the dangers that there are in it, and also the delightful experiences that lie ahead as we approach you in Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray, amen. The word intimacy is not found in the King James Version of the Bible. It's possible there was no such word in the English language when the King James Version was translated in 1611. However, it is a word now, a very legitimate word in common use today. Therefore, it does appear in some of the modern English translations. That points up a legitimate need for modern speech translations. Some of you have written me and asked why we need new translations. Well, this is one reason. I wouldn't venture a guess how many new words were added to our English dictionaries just last year alone. We'll be using these new words now to express old thoughts about, um, well, just about everything, including our faith in God and in Christ. Now, this is not an endorsement of all modern versions. Of course not. And I pray you won't take it as such. Of course, there are versions that are given for other reasons, and that would be to promote some kind of a, one of which would be to promote some kind of a theological a doctrine maybe not found in the King James Version. But since some of the English words used 400 years ago are no longer in common use, and you know, someone sent me a list of some 500 such words, probably there are more, and, and since we're constantly coining new words to express those thoughts, it's helpful to have a reliable, and I stress a reliable, translation of God's Word in the vocabulary currently in use. 
Well, the dictionary defines intimacy as the state of being intimate. Of intimate, it says, belonging to or characterizing one's deepest nature, marked by very close association, marked by warm friendship through long association, suggesting informal warmth or privacy of a personal and private nature. To a lot of people, that defines a sexual relationship. It is certainly included, all right, but it could hardly be that exclusively. But look, that's what the Bible is saying in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. Now, this isn't Adam's first introduction to Eve, so that isn't what's meant in that verse. That had already taken place, you see, and we'll return to that a bit later. But here he knew her intimately, sexually, and she conceived. The same idea is in Genesis 4.25, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. That intimacy is sexual. In some daytime talk shows, a guest might be asked, were you intimate? Meaning, of course, did you have sexual relations? And despite the fact that some people deny it, even some theologians deny it, that's exactly the situation in Sodom in Genesis chapter 19, verses 1 to 11, when the Scripture says, The men of Sodom compassed the house, that is, Lot's house, round about, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot, and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. Now, <clears throat> don't let yourself be deceived into believing that these men, men were the welcoming committee from the Chamber of Commerce to come out to get acquainted with the uh, lodge guests. They wanted sexual knowledge, what's sometimes called carnal knowledge of these men, and <clears throat> Since they refused to accept Lot's daughters instead, it's clearly obvious they wanted a homosexual relationship. This is the sin of Sodom that God calls grievous in Genesis chapter 18, verse 20, for which he utterly destroyed the city. So that's one aspect of intimacy in the Scriptures. There's another kind of intimacy in the Bible, too. It's found in Genesis chapter 2 in the creation story. When all the animals which God had made were brought before Adam, he gave them names. But among them all, there was no suitable help meet found for Adam. So, it said in Genesis 2.21, The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from Adam made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That's an intimate relationship, the most intimate relationship we'll ever know on this earth. In Ephesians 5, 22, 33, the Holy Spirit uses this one flesh intimacy to teach us another kind, a very, very close relationship between God and His church. He says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, 
and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, he says, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. <coughs> the idea of intimacy with God is nothing new. It's taught in the Scriptures. I believe that's what's meant in Genesis 3 and 8 when it said, And they, Adam and Eve, heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. I must admit I don't comprehend all that says, but I believe the Holy Spirit is conveying the idea of a very warm and close and intimate fellowship for which God created man, and which existed between him and his offspring, mankind. Acts 17, verses 28 and 29, the Apostle Paul affirms that we are his offspring. And this very close and intimate relationship existed between God and man prior to the transgression, which relationship is restored when man is reconciled to God by Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us unto himself in Christ Jesus, and has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Oh, then, that kind of relationship is restored. But it's been talked up for a long time in some theological circles as an alternative to what some have called dead orthodoxy, and more recently others have dubbed legalism. It's an escape from the sound doctrine that we read about in 2 Timothy 4 and 3 and in other passages of Scripture. It's a kind of super spirituality that's founded not on the Word of God, but that grows out of what feels like a super experience with God, which has resulted, first of all, in the trivialization of God and also in the abandonment of the doctrines of the atoning and mediatorial works of Christ and in the rejection of biblical authority, and in the desertion of real Christianity. Also, it has resulted in further fragmentation of the believers into super sects and denomination. But what we are encouraging in this study of intimacy with God, as we also expose the dangers and the pitfalls uh, of which we just have spoken, is a person's genuine Bible-based, close-up knowledge of God, a genuine nearness to God, as the Holy Spirit compares it to the closeness of the husband and wife relationship. It's a closer walk with God. It's that walk that David describes. The shepherd boy who had become king said in that greatly loved 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We're saying what the Apostle Paul is saying in the New Testament. What things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ my Lord, for whom I suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. Philippians 3, 7 uh, through 8 and 10. What we, uh, and, what, and what he also wrote about, 
I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed unto him against that day. That's in 2 Timothy 1 and 2. And again in 2 Timothy 4, 16, 18, At my first answer no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it will not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to, be, uh, to whom be glory forever and ever. It's what John is saying in 1 John 1 and 3, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship or partnership or joint participation or communion with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And it's what Jesus Himself was talking about in that prayer the night before His crucifixion. Father, he prayed, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he, might, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. John 17, 1 and 3, as we read it earlier. It's the closer walk with God that we sing about. O Master, let me walk with thee in lowly paths of service free. Tell me thy secret. Help me bear the strain of toil and the fret of care. Or when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. And there is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest, near to the heart of God. And another, nearer, still nearer, close to thy heart. Draw me, my Savior, so precious thou art. Fold me, oh, fold me, close to thy breast. Shelter me safe in that haven of rest. Finally, there's that favorite of many written by our beloved friend L.O. Sanderson, now deceased. Be with me, Lord. I cannot live without thee. I dare not try Try to take one step alone. I cannot bear the loads of life unaided. I need thy strength to lean myself upon. So what we're talking about in these messages about intimacy with God is knowing God and living in conformity with His will, the desirability of it, and the dangers of it. Dear Father, we're so thankful that we who are thy offspring may have access to communion and fellowship with Thee through Thy Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Enoch is a name that's familiar to most Bible readers basically for two reasons. First, he's one of only two people of whom the Bible says he walked with God. The other was Noah. The second reason uh, we remember him is that uh, he walked so closely with God that he pleased God and he didn't die for God just took him. The New Testament book of Hebrews says of him, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. Enoch's life then is a biblical example of intimacy with God. He lived close to God. His life was not one of austerity and contemplation, far removed from the interests and the cares of the world. It wasn't that he joined a monastery and cut himself off from the rest of the world to walk with God. His wasn't a life without fault either. Of course it wasn't, nor was Noah's. They were men of like passions with us, as the Bible says of Elijah in James 5:17. But Enoch believed in God, and it said of him, that he pleased God, meaning he obeyed God. The prophet Amos asked, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Amos 3 and 3. Intimacy with God is knowing God up close. And the Holy Spirit says, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. 1 John 2 and 3. That makes sense, doesn't it? How can a person say he knows God who doesn't permit God to direct his ways? In the next verse he says, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Oh, that's strong language. But it's the truth, straight from the Holy Spirit. My friend, how is it with you? Are you living and walking close to the Lord? Have you committed your life and yourself to Him and His will? I certainly hope so. But we hear from television viewers every week who, were, who are not doing so, but have now turned their lives around to do just that. If you haven't already done so, may I insist that you do it today. Repent and be baptized into Jesus at once. Say, the Lord's way to live life is the best way, the very best. Get to know God. He'll be a blessing to you. He's never been known to be anything but a blessing to anyone. This is the message, the first message in, in four to be delivered this month on the subject of intimacy with God, which at the end of the month will be available to you absolutely free for the asking. If you think you'd like or profit from uh, having all of them to read in the quietness of your home, simply address your request for the book about God to In Search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma 73083. As you see there on the television screen, the email address is search at aol.com. The toll-free telephone number is 1-800-321-8633. Worship with us as the Church of Christ this week, will you? We love you. God bless you.